So consider again complements of mental state, that is, sentences under verbs of mental state. The policeman thought he caught me. Notice me, the pronoun, is still my pronoun. It's not the policeman's pronoun. It stayed the same in the complement. The policeman, that the speaker is referring to me, not the policeman. Right? Um, the policeman thought he caught me over there. Me and over there are still my perspective. Um, the policeman thought he caught me over there and by that light, I'm trying to, you know, multiply the number of different perspective-taking terms. They're still all mine, the speakers. Um, when it comes to these type, the policeman thought he caught a Burmese short hair. Well, did he? <laughs> I know it is a Burmese short hair, but does the policeman somehow I now have to take into account what the policeman knows, not just what I know. Or the policeman thought he caught an adorable cat. Is that my perspective or the policeman's? I think you can kind of get both. Um, there's a difference between pronouns and spatial dexas, which continue to be the speaker's point of view, and nouns and taste adjectives that seem to require that the point of view of the subject of the sentence be taken into account. Um, and this perspective sensitivity of personal taste adjectives um, is affected by the structural factor. So I'm not sure if Hazel's going to mention this this afternoon, but um, people who worry about words like adorable and yucky and nice and so forth say that one possible semantic perspective is that they take their meaning from some judge in the context. Um, and you choose the judge on the basis of purely contextual semantic factors. But in fact, they are limited by uh, the structural factor of whether they're in a complement or not. That limits who the judge is. So embedded clauses make no difference to the point of view of the more ordinary kind, pronouns and dexas, at least in English. And I offer that qualification there because there are these strange behaviors of personal pronouns in languages like Navajo, uh, which Peggy Spies has studied, um, where they can refer back to the subject of the sentence. Um, but nevertheless, they do represent in one sentence the different point of view of a subject other than the speaker, as in the case of the nouns and the uh, other adjectives. So this doesn't, um, this doesn't exhaust the range of possibilities across languages. So I'd like to um, spend a little time on another possible device. We don't have it explicitly in English. Uh, that could be just as good at conveying the contrast in another's mind, and that is the case of evidentials in languages like Tibetan. So I think perhaps you might want a cup of coffee before I go into this. <laughs> you want to take five minutes and get a cup of coffee and then come back ready to face the analysis of the language like Tibetan? Okay. <laughs> occur in about a quarter of the world's languages. I'm not sure we know that for sure. And they are grammatical inflections that indicate the nature or source of evidence for a claim. So they are neither epistemic modals, nor are they attitude verbs. Um, they are egophoric. They are with respect to the person speaking. Um, they are restricted in range. That is, you don't get every possible type of how you would know something. There's only a small variety of possibilities. Um, and why this is so is an interesting puzzle that uh, Peggy Spies has addressed in some of her work. Um, they don't embed, so you don't get embedded evidentials. And the information they um, project, inject, is not at issue. It's not a question of truth for the person who's using them. So let me give you some um, examples from Tibetan. Um, Tibetan is a head final language in which the main verb of most sentences is a kind of copula or a verb of existence. 
and Tibetan evidentials attached to that and are distinctive forms of this copula or verb of existence. And so just about every Tibetan assertion or question contains one of these markers. Uh, for example, there are ego evidentials. I'll say more about them in a minute. There are direct evidentials, which mean were, was the event witnessed. They are indirect evidentials, in which you um, see a sign of something that isn't the thing itself, but you draw a conclusion about the thing itself. And then there are this, I find, disturbing category of neutral, where you don't commit to how you know something. That's a little bit of a problem, I think. It would be nice if they, but you know, how do I know that Paris is the capital of France? I have no idea how I know that. Was I told it? Did I learn it from a book? Did my mother tell me? I just don't know. So there have to be some things that you just know, but you have no idea where you know them from. So Tibetan speakers agree, I guess. All right. So let's look at the uh, ego copulas that form yin and yo. Um, you put them at the end of sentences like, I'm happy, only you could know, right? It's a personal piece of knowledge. Or, um, I have a dog. Maybe you're the only person in the company who knows that. Um, so there's a difference between things that are in your own mind or things about your possessions. And then, more interestingly, perhaps, are the direct evidentials, which have certain felicity conditions. Uh, in particular, did you witness this thing that you're describing? So if I say there's a dog behind the wall, I have to indicate that I saw it. Duke, I, I know it directly by seeing, by witnessing. Um, and then there's a form song, um, which means I directly witnessed a past action. They went to Lhasa, and I saw them go. Uh, and then the shak, which is a direct resultative, uh, in which the vase broke. You see the pieces, but perhaps you didn't actually see the person breaking it. Um, then there are these indirect evidentials, which have different felicity conditions. In particular, you could say something like, Tashi is in his office, Yosare, which basically means, um, I have the specific bit of evidence that tells me that. His wet umbrella is standing outside his office. Right? Or his door is open, and it's only open when he's in his office. Or more general inference, yogire, in which Tashi is, is in his office, yogire means I looked on the, um, on the syllabus and he holds office hours at 4 o'clock on Tuesday, so he must be in his office. But it's not an epistemic modal. Um, then there are these neutral cases like there are many yaks in Tibet. I don't quite hear how. I know that, so I just say re. Um, so let's compare these evidentials with propositional attitude verbs like compliments. Both of them present very interesting acquisition challenges because they refer to hidden properties of mental events. Um, the child has to learn to use evidentials on the basis of hearing them from other people who have had different experiences and, uh, and therefore belief states than they have. Um, propositional uh, the difference between them is evidentials don't embed clauses, and propositional attitude verbs can take subjects that are first or second or third person, whereas evidentials are always in reference to the self, egophoric. Uh, so unlike modals or statements about evidence, evidentials are felicitous when the truth or falsehood is known, so, um, in English, I can say, for example, there is evidence that Dolma went to Shigatsi, but I don't believe she went there. It's not incompatible to say that. But you absolutely can't um, say in English, Dolma went to Shigatsi, but I don't believe she went there. That's Moore's paradox for those in philosophy. And it's the same with an evidential in Tibetan, you simply can't say, Dolma went to Shigatse, Yogi Rei, or um, 
Duke, but, she, but I don't believe she went there. It's just out of the question. When you use an evidential, you're saying, here is a true statement, and this is how I know it. So you can't follow it by saying, and I don't believe it. It's just not going to work. Um, so, uh, yeah, in Tibetan, you can say, um, Dolma went to Shigatse. Wait a minute, you can't say this. <laughs> um, but I don't believe she went there. So, um, yeah, that's Moore's paradox in the same way. That's right. It's the first one there. I don't understand the difference between those two sentences now. Just pay attention to the bottom of the screen. <laughs> that's the true bit. <laughs> okay, so um, how do we tell evidentials apart from epistemic models? One feature is deniability. And this is a very subtle point. So I can say in English, it must be the butler who did it. After have to read a mystery in Agatha Christie mystery or something, right? Um, and somebody else can say, no, that's not true. It could be the maid, right? So you can actually deny an epistemic model, but evidentials can't be denied. So um, only the proposition to which they're attached. So if I deny uh, that um, when I deny something like the butler did it, look, you're not allowed to say, no, you didn't see it. Um, you're only allowed to deny the butler did it. It's a bit like saying, in English, if I say, I suspect it's the butler, somebody can't say, no, you don't. It's just crazy, right? I know my mind. Um, so it's the same thing with, with the credentials. Um, so English modals and attitude verbs are deniable, um, and uh, it's not true that uh, you can deny the truth of an evidential. Evidentials are not deniable. Um, you can't say that's not true, you didn't see it. So, because evidentials are illocutionary and don't participate in these truth conditions, there's no deniability, and perhaps because they are egophoric, that is, they refer to one individual, the first person, not the others, they are poor alternatives for representing others' false beliefs. And, in fact, the work that we've done on Tibetan, looking at the acquisition of Tibetan evidentials and looking in parallel at the development of false belief understanding in Tibetan kids has revealed virtually no correspondence between their ability on evidentials and their ability on false beliefs. Uh, despite my colleague's strong belief that evidentials would provide an alternative way of grasping these concepts in Tibetan, it didn't turn out that way. We don't have any evidence for a relationship. Okay, so let me go back to compliments. Um, I've tried to make the case that compliments have some special properties that let them capture false beliefs or representing alternative point of views. But will any kind of compliment suffice? This is another little linguistic um, tangent that I hope will mean something to some of you. Um, Tom Roper and I have worked on this quite closely, and we've made the case that tensed clauses are really critical here not infinitival clauses, because they provide a mechanism by which the point of view of the lower clause can get subordinated to the subject of the um, matrix clause, and by that mechanism um, achieve the result that the whole sentence can be true even though the complement clause itself is false, if you detached it from the clause, uh, from the sentence as a whole. So, um, verbs are subcategorized not only by whether they take a complement. So, for example, if I have a verb like fell, I can't follow it with a that clause. Uh, but if I have a verb like think or say, I can follow it with a that clause. So, some verbs don't take complements at all. But the verbs that do take complements also subcategorize for whether they can take a tensed complement 
or a non-finite complement or a subjunctive complement, especially in uh, many Romance languages. And what we've argued is that tense or finiteness is the domain in which truth or assertion seems to be closely linked. So um, Klein, for example, discusses the notion of finiteness as follows, that finiteness as a feature um, carries two distinct meaning components, the tense component, it marks, for example, past in contrast to present or future, and also it marks that an assertion is being made with respect to the proposition, in contrast to the possibility that no such assertion is being made. And we'll see how those play out. Um, so verbs of mental state or communication project a point of view feature onto their complements in our um, uh, lingo. So the woman said that she bought a cake. So this, that she bought a cake, is the woman's point of view. The, um, the subject of the sentence, whereas the whole sentence is from the speaker's point of view. So I have, in my truth, the truth of the whole sentence, the woman said that she bought a cake, and in the woman's point of view, this sentence is true, that she bought a cake. But that might not be my understanding, right? So ordinary sentences are from the point of view of the speaker, and embedded clauses can be from the point of view of the subject. And this is true both for the truth of the clause and the um, intentions or the uh, descriptive words that are contained within it. And for the judge for personal taste adjectives, as I showed before with the policeman, faulty quarter, an adorable dog. So the argument has been in linguistics for other quite independent purposes that tense moves to the clause boundary, the CP, um, overtly in some languages and covertly in a language like English. It doesn't appear to move to CP in English, like it does, for example, overtly in German, but it does covertly for certain reasons. And we've argued that perhaps this tense movement has both a syntactic motivation in some languages and a semantic motivation if it also carries with it a point of view shift that allows the subject of the sentence to have the point of view um, imposed on the embedded clause. So the point of view feature on tense carries a default speaker value unless and until it is moved to the CP in an embedded clause, where it's revalued um, in the lexical properties of the uh, higher verb projection. So this is the theory. Um, in uh, intuitive terms, in the sentence, the woman said that she bought a cake, the upper verb, say, imposes the subject, that is the woman's, point of view on the lower proposition. So technically, the higher verb forces the lower CP and TP to inherit its projections, which includes the complementizer, of the indirect question marker, and the point of view. So it's possible that if children don't carry out this covert operation of moving tense to the CP, or if the CP is kind of frozen as having the speaker's point of view, then they might misunderstand opaque compliments and assume that that has to be true with respect to them, not with respect to the subject. So this is a possible mechanism for what could go wrong in the development of complementation. It makes an interesting prediction that if there is no tense, as in possibly an infinitival clause, then it will carry no point of view shift, and children should not produce errors with complementation when there's an infinitive, not a tense marker, because there's no reason for there being a discrepancy. So let me show you some um, examples, but first, uh, let me just remind you of our measures with something like long distance WA questions, like what did Mary say she bought? Um, we have the WH word moving to the front of the lower phase, and um, that's actually outside the phase and is interpreted in the next higher phase, so it eventually ends up in the front of the sentence. 
um, that isn't really necessary for what I'm going to say, except we use WH questions uh, to, as an index of understanding. So the prediction is we'll find a contrast between sentences that involve WHs extracted from a tense clause and those from an infinitive. Um, and therefore, children should not ever give reality interpretations when the clause is not finite. So let me make it concrete. Okay, we used a single verb say that has the nice property that it takes both types of complement. So for example, we could ask, what did Jimmy say dad got for the party? That's the classic tensed complement case. And we could also say, what did Jimmy say to get for the party? Where it's a non-finite case. And in the study, which I won't go into detail about these kinds, we also had yes, no questions. Did Jimmy say what dad got for the party? And did Jimmy say what to get for the party? Uh, I'm not going to go into those uh, because they actually are somewhat ambiguous for adults. A hypothesis is that tensed clauses would produce the usual high rate of incorrect WH answers, um, but infinitival clauses would be better understood because they don't involve um, this transfer and that the understanding of the infinitive might occur at age four, at three, but resolution of the tensed clause only at um, four. Okay, so we created four little books and two were about home and two were about preschool, each of which contained eight stories and questions and they were counterbalanced by type across children. So each child actually saw two books uh, totaling 16 stories and questions, but they never got, I'll show you, they never got both questions about a given story. So here's an example. Dad asks Jimmy, what kind of games would you and your friends like for the Halloween party? Jimmy tells Dad, oh, pick some pumpkins to paint, please. But the store is having a special sale on all kinds of balloons, so Dad buys them instead of pumpkins. So there's a mismatch, right? Um, the WH question is, what did Jimmy say to get for the party? He actually told him to get pumpkins, but he instead bought balloons. So there's a discrepancy, right, between the tense, uh, between the uh, two um, things, which should be a problem if a child has executive function issues just the same way as they would for a tense clause, but on our prediction, they should actually do pretty well with this case because it doesn't involve any kind of truth transfer. The non-finite clause, to get for the party, has actually no particular truth value, um, unlike the tense case. So let me give you another example. Um, here's a finite complement case. Today, it's Jimmy's turn to feed the class pet rabbit. Another student asks the teacher, can I feed the rabbit today? The teacher tells him, I'm sorry, but Jimmy already gave the rabbit a carrot for the day. But before, when the teacher was outside, Jimmy couldn't find the carrot, so instead Jimmy gave the rabbit a piece of apple from his lunchbox. The question is, what did the teacher say Jimmy gave the rabbit? Again, discrepant from what really happened, but now in a tense form, um, the teacher told the other kid that Jimmy gave the rabbit a carrot, but in fact he gave it an apple. Um, so the participants in this were 32 kids aged 3 to 5, and they were tested individually on two occasions. We divided them into the three-year-olds and the four-year-olds um, to see if there was a difference between them. And these are errors. These are not correct, these are errors. And you can see that on the tense clause, they make a lot of errors uh, at three, especially on the tense clause. And they make fewer errors, but still significant number on the tense clause at four. Um, the three-year-olds are still making some errors on the infinitival, but the four-year-olds are doing much, much better on the infinitival. So it's very clear the infinitival clause is being understood before the tensed clause. 
and that's in keeping with our prediction. Um, I should mention that the books were the same, that everything was counterbalanced. So it isn't that one story is more difficult than another, in case you got that impression from those two. Um, they weren't matched in length and were balanced so that the stories were the same. So it's not an artifact of the story. Um, so we predicted and found a highly significant difference between tensed and infinitival complements, even though both of them involved disparities between what was said and what happened. Uh, the tense clause was particularly prone to produce those errors, and we take them as compatible with the uh, story in minimalism that children um, uh, prefer to complete the analysis of a clause one phase at a time, and not, in fact, understand that you have to open that phase to the possibility of the subject matrix. That's part of a larger story. Um, but basically, tense in the lower clause invites the completion of that phase, and the child interprets it independently, if you like, of the subject uh, truth. Um, I want to mention a little bit about an alternative position that's come out recently by um, Lewis and Hackard and Litz that say that um, children's difficulty with belief verbs is because they underestimate the relevance of a character's mental state. And they point out that in adult language, we sometimes use um, clauses with think in it fairly loosely to just say the truth. So for example, Sally might say, where's Rob? And Anne says, oh, Dave thinks he's at the beach. And it hasn't really got any particular meaning to put Dave thinks in there. It's just answering Dave's at the beach. And so this is how I know it. It's a bit like an evidential, right? Um, and they designed scenarios to try and emphasize that different people had different beliefs. And when they did that, they found better success in a truth value judgment task by four-year-olds than if they didn't have contrasting beliefs in the same story. Um, so they conclude that children are not, in fact, delayed in their understanding of complementation because of syntax, but they're delayed because of the pragmatics of understanding when verbs of, that take these complements are relevant to truth conditions and when they are not. Um, but I want to say that these data from our study on finite and non-finite forms, um, we think that's not the entire story because the contrasts in belief may help, but there's still something about the interaction with tense that bears some attention because I don't think that um, this story would apply to the difference that we find between tense and non-finite clauses. Okay. Um, the final piece I want to talk about, and I'm going to try and do this in a short order, so we have time for questions, um, is the argument about recursion. You remember recursion was one of those properties that mental attitudes, propositional attitudes have, and it's also conveniently a property that complements have, unlike other forms that I discussed that have point of view. So. Um, Perhaps recursion is the key to all this, not embedding, but recursion. Uh, and perhaps single level complements are insufficiently rich to represent propositional attitudes in their entirety, and are perhaps easy, easily mimicked by less embedded structures. So people have suggested, and we've, we're among those people, who've suggested that children might treat a sentence like, Jill said, that she had an orange as something like Jill sayingly had an orange, you know, some kind of an adverbial qualifier on the truth of the sentence. So perhaps children begin understanding these things as something less than they really are. Perhaps the key to both mastery of compliments and mastery of false beliefs is when you turn to second level recursion. That is, two levels of embedding might be more um, uh, representative, if you like, of true complementation. So um, Tom Roper has argued that true recursion is infinite. There's no limit on uh, the number of sentences that you can embed. Of course, you wear yourself out. But nevertheless, it's, uh, there's no principled limit. 
And languages furthermore vary in which elements they allow to be fully recursive. Um, so as an example, um, you get compounds in French, but they only involve two nouns. They're fairly idiomatic. Uh, you can't freely embed nouns into compounds in French the way you can in English. Um, English allows things like frogman, apron string, computer disk, and so on. You can just go on and on making up compounds. And of course, we all know about German. Well, go there, but you know, there's free compounding in other languages compared to French. But French does have two. So maybe two isn't enough to know that it's recursive. Um, in, pos in German, you're only allowed one form of possession with an S, whereas in English, you can go on and on. John's brother's girlfriend's school stationery. Um, you can embed uh, possessives. Uh, in English, we have very limited serial verbs. So we can say things like, come help me, go get one. It's only really come and go that can do serial verbs. But in other languages, particularly African languages, I think Bantu has them, um, you can embed freely serial verbs without putting an and in the middle. So you can say things like, start, try this, which we couldn't say in English. So you get two, but you don't necessarily get multiple in every domain of phrases. And so perhaps the real trigger of recursion, the real sign of recursion, is when you can do more than two, because you could just have medium form prior to that.